This is Ruth Broder. It's November 10th, 2005, and we're back with Jane Sherman to finish an interview that we ended rather abruptly at the beginning of the summer. We covered a lot of topics that day. I thank you for coming back because we did talk for a long time, but there was one subject which I think is very important that we really didn't go into. So I want to do some depth on the Jewish Agency for Israel today because you're probably the person in this community that more knows more about the workings of the Jewish Agency than anybody. And I think it would be very valuable for our archives to know the relationship and how it works. Uh, before we start, though, I, after we had our interview, you went to Israel and there was a tribute, I believe, by the Jewish Agency for your father, if I'm not correct. Just tell us a little bit about it. Well, they did do a very poignant um, tribute with music and dancing in tribute, it was a tribute to my father, where um, Salai Miridor, chairman of the Jewish Agency, um, Shimon Perez, Dennis, n not Dennis Ross, Martin Indig, all spoke, and, as well as myself, um, really was quite a beautiful, beautiful evening. Um, you couldn't go out there. It, it wasn't a crying evening, but they showed pictures of my father going back, obviously to his childhood, gave some history, but basically the history of his involvement in Israel and the Jewish Agency. Regretfully, they couldn't use any film because they couldn't um, transfer it on this fancy new equipment that was available. But it was quite a memorable evening. All my siblings were there, and Marjorie, and most of our husbands, and some of our children. So it really, uh, and people flew over from Detroit for just for the evening. Three or four people came just for the evening. There were about 800 people there. Where was it held? It was held outside at the Israel Museum. Oh, how beautiful. And um, there was, as I say, it was a musical tribute as well as just, not just speeches where they showed the history and the life of the New Orleans and what had happened. In fact, the highlight of many of the men was Miss Israel was there. She's a New Orleans. She's been here for, she's been in Israel for a couple of years, and uh, she's now Miss Israel. So that was uh, quite, uh, quite something. And I assume you were good? Uh, well, I, you'll have to ask somebody else about that. Okay. The tape is, uh, the CD is in the archives. We've given them a copy of the CD Have of, you? The, of the evening. Yes. Great. All right. I'll make a point of seeing that then. All right. Let's get started. And uh, I think we should start with, give us a short history of the Jewish Agency, what it was before Israel was well, the a state, Jew and then what it became. The Jewish Agency was the government before May 1948. And their role, besides doing normal government activities prior to 1948, was to bring in many of the, um, the refugees from the war, most of them. In fact, they were in charge of bringing them in and giving them guns and send, sending them out to um, fight the war that uh, occurred in 1948. After the government was formed, the Jewish Agency came, became what is now, was referred to as a quasi-governmental agency. And the third law put in effect in the State of Israel, passed by the Knesset, was the law um, of, for the future of the Jewish Agency, where their role was the ingathering of the exiles and resettling the land. And that's what they have been doing for the last um, 58 years. 58? Is that what it is? 58? Seems to be. 56. Um, they, uh, we brought in more than two and a half million immigrants, close to, fact, close to three million Im new immigrants into the country. Uh, we've built more than 800 kibbutzim and moshavim, taking care of ch th hundreds of thousands of children in youth aliyah villages. And as far as the absorption and immigration absorption process that continues today and I imagine it will continue even though there's a new focus um, until every Jew that wants to come to Israel is there. But it is the law of the State of Israel that is our role as um, members of the Jewish Agency. 
1971, the Jewish agency was reconstituted. I assume before that time, the Israelis were in full charge. Well, it wasn't as just Israelis. It was the World Zionist Organization. Were they there before 71 even? Yes, they, the, the Jewish agency basically was run by the World Zionist Organization prior to 1971, uh, even though the money came from uh, the Jews of the world. Uh, the World Zionist Organization was made up at the time of di the different political parties um, that were voted into the government of Israel. That didn't mean they were political people that were in the Knesset, but it could be a political party that sent a representative from the United States or Canada or any place else. They were the people that, uh, that ran the Jewish agency with funds that were sent basically from the American Jewish community, but many of the f some funds came from the rest of the diaspora. What was the change that was made in 1971? Well, well the feeling was that the, particularly <coughs> on the American side, which I can speak to better, is that when my father sat down with Louis Pincus, who at the t time was chairman of the executive the, of the WZO and chairman of the Jewish, of the executive of the Jewish agency, that the um, world Jewish community needed to have a say in what was going on. And so the Jewish agency was reconstituted to represent that interest. And 50% of the board was made up of representatives from the, and the, the diaspora that were not members of the WZO, and 50% were made up as members that were members of the WZO. So that we've had much more representation and much more involvement in where the funds, where and how the funds were expended and could get the world Jewish community involved in what was going on in the state of Israel. And the governing board, so to speak, I mean, there were two, two um, okay, the, parts of it. Yes, there are, um, the governing board of the Jewish agency in 1971, I'm gonna sneeze, you're gonna have to stop. Okay, okay, the governing, are we ready? Yeah. The governing board of the Jewish agency um, well, I'll, let me give you the tier. Uh, the, the agreement was made there would be a chairman of the executive, which would be head of the WZO. At the time, it was Louis Pincus, and a chairman of the board. And the chairman would, of the board was representative of the diaspora, and in that case, it was Max Fisher. Under the, uh, the next tier down was the executive. And the, the executive of the Jewish agency was represented 50% from the diaspora and 50% from the di WZO. And that was made up of, uh, I think at the time it was 24 members. Uh, <clears throat> and then the next layer was the Board of Governors, which was 72 members. Again, the same percentages. And our percentage, the, the fundraisers, as we were called at the time, was made up of 60% um, from the United States and the rest from the communities, Jewish communities throughout the world, from um, be it Canada, England, France, et cetera, et cetera. And that percentage ratio is represented to this day. The uh, head of the Board of Governors is chosen how? That, that's the diaspora person. How is that, that person chosen? That person is put up for, can either put their name in or is put up for election. They are approved by a <coughs> nominating committee from the diaspora side, but they must go, and this is after, way after 1971, I think it was in 1991 when this was reconstituted, they must have the advice and consent of the WZO, and vice versa, their side, we, we must give advice and consent to their candidates for the head of the um, world, uh, the head of the executive. Is the head of is the executive always an Israeli? It always has been. I would assume I could not see any um, scenario where the WZO would elect a non-Israeli as head of the WZO. I think it would be tantamount. It's, it's against everything they believe in. The World Zionist Organization built the state of Israel. They're a major part of it, even though all their members are not, not um, Israeli citizens because it's a far-reaching effect, whether it's the reform movement or the American Zionist movement or Hadassah. Many of these people are not members of the, uh, not Israeli citizens, but they're members of the World Zionist Organization, which, by the way, every one of us can be a member and can vote on. But the advice and consent procedure has gone through 
It's not a veto. It's a fact that we present now. The way it really works with the chairman of the World Zionist executive, the Louis Pincuses and the um, uh, Salai Miridors and now Zeb Bielski is the prime minister. It comes to the, the name is put forward to the diaspora by the gover the prime minister of Israel. And he presents it to the WZO. And they bring it to us for advice and consent. That's, mm -hmm. that's the procedure. And having just gone through it in May, I'm very, very familiar with the system. Okay. All right, I think that brings us up to date on the history and what they do basically, although I know over the years it has changed with immigration patterns and that sort of thing. Let's talk about your work in okay. the Jewish well, okay, You want to go back a minute Yeah, I want to go back a minute because I think it's very important because there was another reconstitution, there was another change, reconstitution, <coughs> if that's the term you want to call it, to the Jewish agency. And I'd like to do a little bit of the history. In the early 1980s, when the Jewish Agency and World Jewry began to get involved in Project Renewal, mm -hmm. communities from off the world began to get very involved in what was going in the state of Israel, I mean, in, on an on-site basis. And they wanted to even have more say, because really, even with the reconstitution between 1971 and 1981, nothing really changed. But now they, the world Jewish community really became involved, particularly from the American side, um, wanted to have more say in what went on. And as time went on, there were lots of things that they were unhappy with, lots of things they were happy with, but they felt they needed to have more say, um, that the D Jewish agency had this um, reputation of being a place where you put all, the government of Israel put all their old fogies just to let them sit out their years. And we began to feel that this needed to be changed. So in, I believe it was 1991, and I need to go back and look in the books, there was another change in the Jewish agency. First of all, the board was enlarged. Number two, all th sorts of decisions were made. The director generals were no longer hired because the chairman of the department had a favor to give out. It had to go through a procedure, a tender went out, and the best person was hired for the job. A committee of the Board of Governors was set to hire these people so that we would have really accomplished people in the positions of uh, director generals. All the chairmen of the departments had to be go through the advice and cons consent. The head of the rural, it was time the Rural Settlement Department, the Aliyah Department, um, the Youth Aliyah Department, those were the three major departments in the, 90, the early 90s, late 80s. They all had to go through advice and consent. And they also made chairman of the committees from the diaspora. So every one of the committees that you had would be represented for the committees. But when the chairman of the committees left Israel, the head of the department ran the department and they didn't have a lot to say, say about what was happening. So you had a director general in there that is now efficient, supposedly the most accomplished in this field, et cetera, et cetera. But this, there's still things weren't worked out and uh, the way the, f the feeling was in the, um, uh, by the diaspora that they had enough say. They didn't want the chairman of the departments to be political, and I'm saying this not in a pejorative way, but this is the term was used, political hacks. So it came to the position that there were going to be co-chairmen of the departments. And this happened in the late 90s, 1990, I think it was 1999, maybe 2000, that they were now co-chairmen of the departments. And each one of them had to go through advice and consent. The, the, American Jew, the world Jewish community had one chairman, and the Zionist, the world Zionist organization put up another chairman. And they today, the situation we're in today, run as co-chairmen of the department. I serve as co-chairman of the Israel Department. Paula Edelstein is my counterpart. She happens to be head of the reform movement in Israel. We do things in tandem. They are no longer paid by the Jewish agency. We can, if, I, if she has an office, I'm entitled to one office. If she gets a car phone, I'm entitled to one. I mean, I don't want any of it, but I'm just telling you the procedure. That it is now we work in tandem and we work together. So we have much, we feel we have much more say um, and what's going on. Another thing that has happened in the past f four years, and I have to credit Salai Mirador for this, many of the uh, feelings of the Jewish agency 
being this type of quasi-government organization, not really relating to the, to the Israeli um, people the way we thought, um, because they had no representation. I have to credit Salai Miridor, who's the immediate past chairman and the executive, with, with putting on Israelis that were not from political parties. He worked very hard to get the World Zionist Organization to agree to give up 10 of their slots on the Board of Governors, on the executive, and 10 of those slots now are held by business people. And it, is business, it can be business people, or professors. We have people like um, Avi Noor from AMDA, who was a um, major founder of AMDOCS, uh, David Kolitz, who owns Olo, Ofer Strauss, whose family owns the big chocolate company, mm -hmm. um, uh, Professor Naiman, who was the Minister of Justice, um, a Minister of Finance, but happens to be a leading professor in the State of Israel. They are there representing not the political, polit any political party. They are represented, representatives of the state of Israel. And it's made a major change in the way that things are done within the Jewish agency today. Sounds like, it sounds very different <laughs> than the way it started. All right, tell us what you've been doing. You've had a number of jobs before the one you had today. You've had a number of chairmanships, I know that. So just let's talk about your personal involvement what you did, what you're doing now. You sure don't want to hear about the future of the Jewish Agency? You want to hear about this? We'll talk okay, about okay, the future okay. of the Jewish Agency um, afterwards. I started out, my involvement with the Jewish Agency started out with you in 1994. Did we go, we went to the, our first assembly, 1970, 73, 73 or 74, you and I went to our first assembly. And then with the advent of Project Renewal, I came, became very involved, and I was asked to be the co-chairman of Project Renewal. And I served in that position for a number of years. And in 1983, when Chuck Hofberger became chairman of the Board of Governors, he called me, and I don't think there was such an electorate nomination process as there is today. Today, we have a real nomination process with mm -hmm. a committee that's run by the United Israel Appeal that Vents candidates, goes out and talks to their communities, et cetera, et cetera. But in those days, I'm not so sure they did it. Anyway, I got a call from Chuck one day asking me if I wanted to serve on the Board of Governors. I mean, I thought I'd been asked to go to the moon. I was so excited. And I went on the Board of Governors, and that's where I got the position with Project Renewal. Following that, um, I was... Give a brief thing of Project Renewal. Project Renewal was a program that Menachem Begin put forth when he became Prime Minister of Israel. He believed we had a social underclass in the state of Israel, which we did. Uh, immigrants that had come in in the early, late 40s, early 50s that had never really gotten out of the Mabarot, um, and they were living below the poverty line. I talk about this, it's, the problem is still there today. That's why I'm kind of laughing, because I want to talk about it and what's happened in today's world. And they didn't really have a chance. In other words, if you take a community um, if you had many of these underprivileged people, the garbage wasn't picked up on their street, but if you lived in the wealthier neighborhood, the garbage was picked up on their street. And we felt with Project Renewal, it could be an involvement where you get the, the it wasn't the establishment telling the people what to do. They were going to become part of the process in deciding their future. And I remember having one meeting in Tel Aviv with the mayor of Tel Aviv, um, Cheech, who was Cheech at the time, where the residents of Hatikva, which was one of the most serious neighborhoods in Israel, um, came in and screamed at him that his, their kids were not getting the proper education. They, he provided it in North Tel Aviv and he didn't provide it there. It was a chance for them to vent, become part of committees, and do and take care of the problems to go to the government or to the mayor and s make sure these things were done on their own. It really was something like um, the Model Cities program, but in Israel it worked. It worked partially. It didn't work all in all the, we were in 80, 89 communities, 89 neighborhoods. It didn't work in all of them, but we built preschools and we built centers and we gave people programs to teach them leadership um, abilities and taught their kids how to um, provide a preschool education and after school education, a chance for them to help really help themselves. Um, and the Israeli government paid for 50 percent. In fact, they wound it was supposed to be a 50 50 deal with the diaspora. It wound up the Israel government wound up paying much more. So that really was the start of um, Israelis beginning to go out and fight for what was rightfully theirs. So Project Renewal um, 
And by the way, there's still one community that 30 years later is still involved in Project Renewal, but we've, you know, we've gone into a new program since then. After I was chairman of Project Renewal, I was asked to take over as chairman of Youth Aliyah. And at the time, Youth Aliyah was residential education for disadvantaged kids. And many of these same children that I'm talking about coming from the environment in Project Renewal. And we had 75 Youth Aliyah villages and we provided residential education. We gave them a chance to graduate from high school at the same level on average as really that had all the advantages and to go into the Army because to go into the Army at any time in Israel you had to really be sophisticated enough to whether it was getting in a tank and understanding how to work it or to today of course it's all done with um, computers you had to be able to you had to be able to do those types of things even 20 years ago so I chaired Youth Aliyah for four or five years went into a couple other positions with the Jewish Agency and then I took in 1990 one, I was asked to chair what was then the Rural Settlement Department. But we were going out of the settlement business because we didn't need to build any. And at the time, we came up with something that we felt needed to take over Project Renewal, and that was Partnership 2000. And Partnership 2000 was a completely different type of thing because you would get really get, we, where we never really got the community, all the community involved in helping themselves in Partnership 2000. The concept was to get more people from all walks of life involved in what was going on in their community. And it's done on a regional basis. Uh, we have 42 partnerships today. Some of them are consortiums. Some of them are like Detroit's involved with the Central Galley, which involves a large area. And it's doing the same type of thing, but it's different programming. In every region, you're doing different things. Um, so that was kind of a kickoff from, but we've done more people to people relationships out of Partnership 2000 probably than anything else, where you've made major, major relationships between Israelis and the diaspora, where they become sisters and brothers and welcome into their homes. So I had that for five years. I had to take a year or two off. I came back, I chaired um, a subcommittee of the Aliyah Department. I then took over the Finance and Administration, which is the um, all the inner workings. I mean, who's paying for the phones and the logistics and where the rent's going and, and how many, uh, many shlichim we should be sending here, there, and everything. The entire administrative budget of the Jewish Agency. And from there... Do you have a partner in that, too? An Israeli no, the, at the time, there was no. Uh, by the way, that budget, that was a budget and finance subcommittee, and the budget and finance subcommittees are chaired by diaspora. They have no co-chairman. Okay. So that, I, that was, and by the way, is when I was chairman of the um, Rural and Urban Development Committee, which is what the Rural Settlement Committee, I had a co-chair and never met him. Never saw the man in my life. I know him now. I, ne I never seen, never came to a meeting. You know, now maybe it's because uh, he had a strong woman, you know, running it, but I never, in, in the Youth Aliyah days, there were no co-chairmen. The diaspora chaired the, mm -hmm. chaired the department. Um, and then I had one year as chairman of the allocations and grants, which gives money to the three streams, plus it's like R&D for the Jewish Agency. They do three-year grants, very much like what we did with the Fisher Community Foundation here. Mm -hmm. You give out three-year three, three -year grants for pilot projects. And a year, and a year ago, I was asked to go back to what was the Rural Development Department, then became the Rural and Urban Development Department, which is now the Israel Department, to co-chair that with Paula Edelstein. And at the same time, the Jewish Agency went through a strategic plan where we realized that we had to come up to what's happening in the modern day Israel. And the Jewish Agency today, based on the strategic plan, is, deal, the deal, plan, is dealing with the next generation, is dealing with partnerships between the diaspora and Israel. And those are two, and bringing Aliyah by choice. Now, all be said and good, we're still getting roughly 25,000 immigrants into the country. Uh, per maybe year. 11 per year, maybe 11,000 from the former Soviet Union, um, a lot from France right now. This is 2005, and uh, after what happened in the last four or five days, uh, we're going to get more. In fact, the French are buying up all the apartments in Jerusalem. 300 a month from Ethiopia, Falashmora, which will have to convert to Jews. Um, and by the way, during all these years, we brought in 80,000 Ethiopians. 
operation. And there are so, still Ethiopians in Ethiopia, though. Well, there's, there's no there. Ethiopian Jews, to, and I will, I'll, I'll discuss that uh, yeah. when we get to the, to the future. But everything at the Jewish Agency today is based on the next generation partnership and Ali of choice. And the whole concept, the education department, in the Jewish Asian, there are now three different departments. There's an Aliyah department, there's an Israel department, and there's an education department. And even though the American Jewish community tries to poo-poo the education department, first of all, in all the other countries throughout the world, they need the education department, but thirdly, so do we. Mm -hmm. This is the department that is gonna provide the long-term programs for our kids to go to Israel, the birthright programs, Mm -hmm. They do all the educational program besides training teachers to go and doing programming to send over here or send any place else in the country. The Aliyah department, obviously, it goes without saying just what the word means, though I was with uh, two Jews last night that did not know what the word Aliyah meant. Hmm. I was absolutely stunned. That's interesting. Uh, it was real interesting. Do they know what Aliyah means? No. Well, they know what it means now. Yeah. So, oh, uh, right. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, anyway, um, we are working on Aliyah by choice. That means that programs like Nefesh Benefesh, which is a program where put together by a young man here in the United States, where they're taking over roughly 3,000 Jews t to Israel, would go with jobs. They get a small stipend, but they're the well-educated people that w they are able to provide jobs in Israel and they are making Aliyah and the return, it's been going on for three years and the return rate is almost zero. Those are just Americans? Just Americans and they get a small so a small stipend. They can get any place from $2,500 to $25,000. Mm -hmm. Aliyah from Choice, the same thing from uh, France. That's still considered Aliyah. Uh, in fact, we have a man in France that's instituting the same type of program in, in France by the name of Benenu. Um, to do the same thing, encourage French people to make Aliyah. So even though there are many Jews coming from the former Soviet Union, the numbers are down. Obviously, we have less of a pool. We can't bring in a million like we did mm -hmm. in the 90s. There's less of a pool, and there's less reason for them to leave. So, um, but there's is a new look. This is what the communities have been demanding. It's a new look. It's, it's uh, a much different one. Now, I've got to go to my department because I talked about the other departments. Right. The Israel department took a long, hard look at what they were doing. First of all, in the middle 90s, the, we gave, the Israel department turned over all but four youth Aliyah villages to the government. I don't want to discuss that it wasn't a good move, but it wasn't, but that's beside the point. We own it's four, done. so we're still, done, still involved in four, four youth Aliyah villages. <coughs> and we were involved in some settlement issues and all sorts of other things, but we, and partnership. But we felt we had to go beyond that, and we had to deal with the scope of the three areas that the Jewish Agency is dealing with. Next Generation, which by the way the Education Department is, partnership. So we came up with a new program called Youth Futures, which is going to be presented, by the way, to this community next week. Even though they've heard about it, I'm presenting mm -hmm. it formally. Youth there is a popula population in the periphery, and I'm only talking about the Galil and the Negev. In Israel today, many of them from those people that came on Aliyah in the 40s, 50s, and 60s are grandchildren of those people. Many of them Ethiopian Jews that have not had the proper education. That you, if the figures are that in many of these areas, 60 or 70 percent of the youth that could finish sixth grade are illiterate in Hebrew, in English, and math. And where Israel at one time was at the top of the spectrum, when on testing zones with countries throughout the world, we used to be third, we are now 38th out of 42 countries. That's not I mean, good this, for the this people is of the book. <laughs> that's right. This is the people of the book. So we came through with a program that involves, first of all, we're dealing with youth from the ages of 6 to 18. We are involving partnerships, which I will explain, and we are involving volunteers, community volunteers in the state of Israel. We are taking, there is a new segment in the state of Israel that is like a Peace Corps, for lack of a better word. I call them Jews and Jeans. Young community volunteers, young volunteers who have finished the army, many of them finished university or in the university, that feel they want to make social change in the state of Israel. 
and they're living in small enclaves and they're going into communities and providing some extra training, extra work, and they get a very small stipend or somebody pays for them a scholarship at a university, but it's minimal. We are using these community volunteers who will move into a city or a region to work with the youth there as their mentors. Everyone is being trained. They will assume one volunteer will assume 10 children, 8 to 10 children, where they are their mentor, their leader, their mother, their father. They'll work with the parents. That's not to take the world. And provide them psychologically, social mentoring, and in the second year, educational type programs. In the th and along with this, we are going to provide in each one of these community areas a ch what we call s um, centers for excellence. And in fact, if you live in, in Kiryat Shimona or you live in Beit Shan, you don't have the, your kids don't have the opportunity to have a piano, maybe not have a piano teacher or a violin teacher or a soccer coach. We are going out and getting volunteers from out the community to be, become, that, become those people. To, so this is a community-wide activity. In other words, if I have a child that needs piano lessons, that wants piano lessons, we'll find somebody in the community that's going to provide that, those kinds of services. So they, they will have the same opportunity as my child that lives in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or whatever. The third thing is that this program is being funded through partnership. There is the Jewish agencies putting in a third, a community or an individual philanthropist throughout the diaspora is putting in a third, and an Israeli philanthropist is putting in a third. And this is something that we have many Israeli philanthropists getting a lot of money. For them to be involved in the Jewish agency mm -hmm. this way, it's really a three-way program. Now the program has just started last week because school really, after all the Hagim, just started, where we've trained the first um, 50 community volunteers. We're working in Hatzor and Sfat. We've started, we are starting in seven other communities this, this year, and we'll add nine more next year. We want to do this. This is going to be evaluated every year. What's going on? We are going to provide these elementary school children with the best advantages they can get anyplace else. And in high school, we are providing them other types of programs that, again, the Jewish agency, some of them we've been involved with, like Atidim, which is run along with the Army, the ID, IDF, NETA, which is a program that's run with Cisco corporations, and Leon Rekanati's um, uh, very well-known Israeli, his foundation, and the Jewish agency and the communities from abroad that provides computer education for high school students so that when they graduate high school they know more about building, programming, and everything there is to computers. So if they cannot matriculate into university, they've got a job out there. But it's become far more than that. So those types of pro programs are being offered to the high school level. I think that this is the wave of the future. It's the wave of the future for all the communities. But for Israel, because if we don't educate these youth, and it has to be done in the periphery, because that's, we need to have the finest educational systems in the periphery so we can get people to move out there rather than all of them staying in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So our region, being the Galilee, must be very important Well, in this. if Detroit decides to go in, I would assume they would go into Nazareth and Migdal Halemic. Mm -hmm. um, there is a need there. Um, there also, we're trying to, one of the, the things we're doing because of this is that we need to move people out into the Galilee, I don't have to tell you, it's more, there's more Arabs, Israeli Arabs, than Jews. Mm -hmm. And the Negev, we need to begin to repopulate the Negev. We've got to have people going there. So we're used, doing, going to a lot of the older communities, development towns, and providing this program there. We're doing it in Demona with an anonymous gift without a community, but Demona probably needs this program more than anybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a year from now, I'll have some statistics on what it's, uh, what it's doing, but it's really providing a, the first chance these young men and women have had to, to really make it. And it's really, when you talk about the figures of how many, you know, 350,000 kids are living below the poverty line today in Israel. Well, we used is to it, talk about the social gap, that's how Well, we, this is more than the social yeah, gap today. Is, uh, it's not just the social gap, it's poverty. Yeah. And pro a lot of it's come about because of the intifada. 
and then more money was spent on um, uh, security. Security, and then at the IDF, um, and not the expense. I mean, the school day has been cut way back. If the Dovrat report goes through, hopefully they'll have um, longer school days, and we'll be able to enhance this. But I don't know what's going to happen. And okay, you were still in, you were just in Israel, so you know bring us up bring us up to date. You will continue with this project, I assume. You're the chairman of it. Yeah, the co-chair, and this will be your priority for a while. Well, I imagine the next year or two, I want to get this program off the ground. What uh, just happened while you were? The well, last was there? A, there was were the, just meetings. Yeah, I just came back from the board of governors. Uh, it was uh, Bilski, our new chairman's first board. Um, and, the, you know, as the October board meeting always is, it's the budgetary meeting. We run on a fiscal year, our fiscal year starts on January 1st, and we have to make the budget for next year. And regretfully, uh, we're getting less money from overseas than we were, even though the overseas, feder and particularly I can speak from the United States, is raising $100 million more, and we're getting less of a percentage. We why is that? I'd like to know why. They're spending more at home. The allocations for overseas are not... To, you know, the only time we get more money for allocations from overseas is if there's a war. And by the way, it's no different with the Jewish a JDC than it is with the Jewish agency. Their money is, their overseas allocations are being cut. Um, there's lots of reasons. Some people sit in their communities and they can't see beyond the forest. Um, the national organization, I don't believe, has done as much as they can to really allocate for the overseas needs. I think this is one of the failures of the merger of UI, UJA and CJF. We have nobody just allocate, uh, advocating for uh, the overseas needs, uh, say, be it joint or the Jewish agency. And I believe that we have lots of issues that have to be dealt with here. Um, so we're dealing with a cut budget. I mean, the United States, is, the United States Jewish community is sending $140 million next year, maybe. Hopefully. And I remember the days they used to send $240 million. Do we have to have a war to get the American Jewish community to understand the importance, they, they, the role they must play in the building, uh, the continued building of the State of Israel? The, you know, to take care of, we brought these immigrants into the state. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility, along with the Israelis, who, by the way, are paying the major burden of the cost to see they become viable, productive citizens. And we're not doing that. Are there still considered to be communities at risk where we have to try to get people out? France probably might be becoming a community at risk, but other are there other there Jewish are a few. communities well, there now? There are a few. I mean, I there Iran obviously. If we can get everybody out, it would be helpful if they want to come. How many Jews would you think? I don't know how many. Any Jews? idea? No. I imagine five thousand. Uh, there's no, I mean, there's, you know, all sorts of feeling if who wants to come out of the for, former Soviet Union. Can what leave? about it, like Argentina, which was a Argentina, problem. they, the Jews are not interested in, you know, most of them are not. In fact, a lot of them came during, after the crisis in Argentina, seem right. to be going back. There are Jews coming from Uruguay, there are some from Venezuela. But it, is it a crisis situation? No. 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 Um, in today's day and age, no. Is joint just as big in all the operations in the other countries then as it always was or is that kind of tailing off a little bit well no they they they're spending a lot of money their big campaign is to take care of Jews in the former Soviet Union the elderly they're not getting money from the the restitution money so they feel they have a responsibility so it's the aged that they really are putting a big push on that's just not saying they're not working in the other countries but right. they feel that's very important right Okay. Do you want to talk more about the future? You're, you're saying that a lot of what happens in the future is going to be dependent on this new Israel committee that you are now the chairman of. Well, I think that, no, I think a what lot What other of, things do you see coming? No, I think the fact that the Jew, I th I'm not saying that what I see in the future, I think that the fact that the um, Jewish agency has changed, it's um, gone through tough times, changing its focus, to meet the requests of the uh, funders, I think is very important. I think we're doing what's being asked. Um, and I think it's gonna be very, very exciting. I mean, when you're able to see in two years from now 
what we do with with the Youth Futures program. We can see if you know one of the programs of the education department is called Massa, and that is jointly funded by the government of Israel, who is throwing in if we raise it fifty million dollars to match fifty million dollars raised throughout the world. The goal is to bring twenty thousand students a year on long term programs to Israel. Now this is over and above birthright, mm -hmm. which we are funded by, by the federations, the philanthropists, the government of the state of Israel, which brings, well, which- How right, many, yeah. Well, I, I will probably bring about 12,000 this year, but we can't bring, I mean, we had 18,000 applications just from the United States and Canada alone for 5,000 spots for winter, winter programs. We That's just don't amazing. have the funding to do it. And yet, if you would talk to the students that have gone on birthright, and, they, and they're the ones, by the way, that are going on the long-term Massa programs, mm -hmm. you would understand the importance. If we want to maintain a Jewish community 50 years from now, it comes by getting our youth involved, not only in Jewish education, and getting them to the state of Israel, and beginning to understand its importance to their future. And um, so that's you know why the whole thing Next Generation is one of the foci um, of the program that we're doing. Is birthright, um, are many of the young people that go on birthright, do they stay or do they mostly come back? No, they can't, they're going for, no, it's 10 days. It's, it's a just ten, a 10 day. It's a 10 day program, they have an option, but I'm saying mo a lot of the people that are going on the long-term programs are the ones that have been on and birthright, birthright, and we'll birthright program. Yeah. Be it Otsma, be it on Young Judea Year Course, whatever the type of program, Mujus. There's all sorts of programs they can go on for Year Course. I'm just wondering whether they're projecting there will be an Aliyah out of all this there is group Ali of people. Well, there is an Aliyah, but I don't know how much, you know, we haven't quite, you know, when we started Otsma, which is a perfect example, yeah. <laughs> we thought maybe there'd be two, three percent come on Aliyah and the rest of them would go back and be speakers in the Jewish community. 35% went in the Jewish communal service field. About 10 or 50% made Aliyah. I mean, it's far beyond the figures. So I imagine numbers. any, when you get any young Jewish adult to Israel at a formal stage in their life, and I can mm -hmm. speak from personal experience, if they've got the guts, they'll make Aliyah. Yeah. You want to say a little bit about the politics of Israel today and what's happening? I mean, it's well, today's a very important thing, and then I'll talk a minute about the Falash Mora. So okay. They can, um, yes. Yesterday there was an election in the Labor Party, and Shimon Peres lost to Amir Peretz, who's head of the um, Histadrut. And Peretz has Labor is now part of a coalition government. We could. Peretz has threatened to leave the government because he feels that they haven't taken care of the less, the disadvantaged, for a lack of a better term. Uh, I, th I believe, personally, it would be very bad for the state of Israel. I think it's the wrong timing. I think that I'd like to see the Sharon government stick it out, be able to stay in the elections next November. I think that the government has made major, major inroads on the road to peace. And I think it would be a mistake. That's my personal opinion. I mean, you know, when yeah. this thing, somebody views this five, ten years from now, they're not going to know what I'm talking about. So it's uh, uh, a moot point. Uh, but I believe that Sharon has really put his neck out on the line with the disengagement, bringing, closing up the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And I think he'll probably do more. I think it's going to only be detrimental to the state of Israel if this happens. He's very, very popular. Forget about what party he represents in the well, Sharon is very... Yeah. They believe, um, the majority of the Israelis believe he's done the right thing. And they'd like to, I think they'd like to continue whether, you know, we've got, and by the way, we're in many of the situation in the state of Israel today, you know, the, why the youth future is because of what's happened in the government and the cutbacks. But I think if we're going to have peace, we have to take the advantage to go that way. All right. Talk a little bit about your upcoming trip to Ethiopia. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we have brought in on Operation Moses and Operation Solomon and, and a few people after that, almost 80,000 Ethiopian Jews. A couple years ago, there, and no, we've continued to bring them in since then. A couple years ago, the Israeli, the rabbinate agreed with the Israeli government that there were Ethiopians that had converted to Christianity many years ago 
were forced into conversion that really were Jews, they were relatives of the Jews we were bringing in. It's like the Muranos. Mm -hmm. And they agreed that those Jews could come back, those Ethiopians, they're not Jews, those Ethiopians could come back to Israel, not on the law of return, but what is called the law of entry. They would enter Israel, they would go through conversion, and then they would become Israeli, Israeli citizens. Um, and by the way, I have to tell you, all Ethiopians are very, are, are much, are, are religious. I mean, they keep, they're Shoma Shabbat, they keep kosher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all, I mean, that's a yeah. tough statement, basically all. So the government of Israel um, and the rabbinate came to this agreement, and we at the Jewish Agency have been bringing in for the last year roughly 300 a month. Uh, the agreement was that the, most of these people are living in camps in Addis and in Gondor because, you know, when the word gets out, they can come into the camps and, and stay there. And um, the number has been set at 17,000. The agreement has been now been made that we will bring in the last 17,000 and that's it. But while, until we can bring them in, we will provide, and it's we, it's the Jewish Agency and the JDC and the Government of Israel, provide education for these kid, people living in the camps. And first, you, interestingly enough, you have to teach them Amharic, to read and write Amharic before you can treat, teach them to read and write Hebrew. Um, begin to give them the conversion process, provide meals, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, we feel that, the, and the, obviously the faster we can get them into Israel, the better off we would be. The problem is that the Ethiopians that are living in the absorption centers are not moving out because they have no money to buy apartments and the mortgage grant that was given to them up until two years ago was taken away. So we've got to have the Ministry of Housing reinstitute the mortgage grant so we can get those Ethiopians out. And it's a very tight, I'm not making it sound easy because the Ethiopian immigration Ali, absorption process is the toughest in the world and we've done a lousy job. I mean, that's not to say we've got some great Ethiopians that achieve the highest standards, but on the whole, it has not been a well done mm -hmm. absorption process. So we would like to bring them in at 600 a month, but we have to have a place to put them and we have to have the money to do it. And one of there's a new campaign the UJC started it's called Operation Promise, and that is to pay for this this program. But I have to say, speaking from the Jewish Agency standpoint, we cannot spend one penny until we have the cash. So that means they'll stay in the camp. So I'm going over there first of all to see what's going on, mm -hmm. um, to see what some of the money that we get from the government grant, from the United States government grant, is being spent on Ethiopians. So I'm going over for three days to visit the camp, see what's happening to have an on-site visit to visit and to take some of the staff with me because I think it's important to know what's going on. Might their entire conversion then still take place on Ethiopian soil? No, is no, no, they, no. They, they well, first, want the conversion I think they're the Israel. conversion. I mean, I haven't talked to the rabbinate, yeah. nor would they talk to me, but I, they want it done there. They want but it there, done. I, there, the lessons and everything else, a lot of it pre-conversion training, and you can see pictures. I saw last week some movies we had taken. Um, of the kids running around, most of them with kippot, but it's tough because you know some of these women have painted, tattooed on their faces crosses, and it's very difficult. And there's some living in Israel today, so but all of them are coming in on some sort of family reunification process. That's very exciting, and, and you'll need to raise more money for this. That's correct. <laughs> Over and above the regular, the allocation we're not getting. Yeah, well, it's the same old story. There's always there's always an issue, and there's always more people to bring in, yes. and that's the story of Israel. Um, what else? What can you think of that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about? We talked about leaving a legacy for your children last time. I don't think we have to. This interview is not going to be complete. I think you have a lot of years ahead of you of involvement in the community both here and Israel, and, and we'll leave that at that. But, uh, you know, this is, there's not a period to this interview because I think you're going to uh, continue on. Well, what I'm doing, I love what I'm doing. I mean, even though I've been doing it for 150 years, sometimes it feels like 150 years, I'd like not to lose the connection with Israel. Uh, <coughs> not, I mean, I'd always have the connection, but I mean, doing something productive, I think, for the state.
Yeah. And um, in lieu of making Aliyah, I guess, the, well, I made Aliyah, it's just I'm not living there. Right. Uh, I guess this is the next best uh, answer to what I'm doing. But on the other hand, I think that um, it's, it's setting an example for the next generation, that they have to be involved in what's going on in Israel. For once that state is, we sit here in this position today, and I know our children, and particularly our grandchildren, don't understand this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, in, it's within our means to be able to teach them that, and I think that's why it's important, and better by example than telling them. I think this is the biggest challenge today, is to get our children and grandchildren as involved even well, emotionally that's, as we That's can. why the Birthright, the Massah program, getting involved in Partnership 2000, getting involved in Youth Futures, because we will use volunteers from over here, I think is very, very important for the next generation. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll stop this interview. I'm sure there will be others in future years because, as I said, you're not finished with your work. So we thank you for sitting still for two of these. You're welcome. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you'll be doing in the future, which we oh. won't talk about now. Okay. I won't bring it up. And thank you very much. I think this has been terrific. You're I hope welcome. you've enjoyed it.